which is an explanation of a parable. But for context, we're going to read the parable, so we'll be looking at verses 1 to 9 first. And you'll find that on page 978. So I'll give you a moment to flick there. Great. So starting at verse 1. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered round him that he got into a boat and sat in it, while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, A farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among the thorns, which grew up and choked the plants. Still, other seed fell on good soil, where it produced a crop a hundred, sixty or thirty times what was sown. He who has ears, let him hear. And now we'll be looking at verse 18 to 23. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. The one who receives the seed that fell among the thorns is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. But the one who received the seed that fell on good soil is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. Thank you very much indeed, Lydia. Well, I wonder what a stranger would make of all this. If a stranger were to come in and observe what goes on in this building and among this group of people week by week, I guess they would find a number of different ways of describing what they see. They might, for example, uh, notice the fact that we sing together, which is not a very common thing in our society outside football stadiums, I suppose, is it? Or they might observe that this community of people is made up of a diverse range of men and women and boys and girls of an unusually wide range of backgrounds, cultures, ages and stages of life. Again, it's a fairly rare thing. They might notice that we quite like hanging out together, that we enjoy talking, as we will do later, over tea and coffee, that we particularly like eating cake. They might also notice that what happens here on Sunday mornings gets replicated throughout the week in a variety of smaller settings as people gather together in groups and families and friendship groups for meals and conversations and Bible studies and, of course, more cake. But no matter what else they observe about our regular pattern of behaviour as a church family, our observant stranger would almost certainly conclude that a major part of Christianity, a major part of being Christian, perhaps the defining part, is the activity that we're engaged in right now, listening to teaching. If this is your first time with us, and as Andy has already said, you're very welcome indeed, you will have already, hopefully, picked this up. 
Yes, we have sung some songs, among other things, and later we will be hanging out and drinking coffee and eating cake. And this morning, we're going to witness that strange event called baptism. But you will have observed, I think, already that the key part of our time together revolves around what we're doing now. The part when someone gets up into this rather uncomfortably high pulpit and teaches for half an hour or perhaps a little bit more and everybody listens. And in case you wondered, the same is true for our children over in the hall. They might have a bit more fun and games than we're going to have, but they too are essentially listening to teaching. And many of the activities and meetings that happen throughout the week are the same, listening to teaching. Now I mention that because this morning we come to one of the most well-known stories that Jesus ever told. And it's all about the importance of listening to teaching. But not any teaching. It's all about the vital importance, the extreme importance, the life and death importance of listening to the teaching of Jesus. Not only listening right now, this morning, but it's about the vital importance of making your life's work listening to the teaching of Jesus. Well, why is listening to Jesus so important? Because Jesus is no ordinary teacher and his words are no ordinary words. On Friday afternoon, King Charles III spoke to the nation on television and millions of people paid close attention to what he said. Closer attention than they would to the weather forecaster, for example, on television. Why? Because he is the king. His words matter. And as we listen to Jesus' words... We're actually listening to the man God has appointed king, not over the UK, but over the entire world, over the entire universe. In fact, we are listening to the words of God, the words of our creator, the words of the one who made us, the words of the one who will judge us. And so there is nothing more important than listening to the words of Jesus. Well, last week, we looked at the story itself in 1 to 9, uh, along with 10 to 17. And this week, we come to the explanation of the story. And we're going to look at it under the three headings you'll see on the sheet. The sowing of the word, the rejection of the word, the harvest of the word. Let's look then at the sowing of the word. Look with me again at verses 1 to 3. That same day, Jesus went out of the house and sat by the lake. Such large crowds gathered around him that he got into a boat and sat in it while all the people stood on the shore. Then he told them many things in parables, saying, a farmer went out to sow his seed. Now, at one level, the parable of the sower is very, very simple. A farmer goes out to sow his seed. He scatters the seed indiscriminately on a number of different surfaces with a number of different results. Only the seed that falls on one of the surfaces actually produces the harvest. The other three come to nothing, but the fourth produces a spectacular crop. That is the story that we looked at last week. It's so simple and perhaps so familiar that it will be tempting for some of us this morning just as it was for the people who first heard it, to actually not give it the attention it deserves, to think that we already know what this story means, that we've heard it before, we've worked it out already, yep, I know what I've got to do, I've got to be the good soil, let's move on. And let me tell you, that was my temptation as I came to teach this passage this week. I've taught on Mark 4, I've taught on Luke 9, I've taught on the parable of the sower, this is going to be, a, as Sherlock Holmes would say, a one-pipe sermon, not a three-pipe sermon. But that is exactly the attitude Jesus wants to challenge with this parable. Verse 9, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. Verse 18, listen then to what the parable of the sower means. Well, what does it mean? 
Well, let's think, first of all, about the most fundamental image in the parable, the sowing of the word. As we saw last week, and I invite you to picture it again, Jesus, in 1 to 3, is teaching a large crowd of people on the lakeshore. He's commanded a boat as a floating pulpit. He has turned the beach into an open-air church meeting, and he is speaking to those who have gathered in very much similar way to which I'm speaking to this gathering now. That is why, by the way, in case you don't know, some churches actually build pulpits to look like boats. It's a good job we didn't do that. It would make you feel a bit seasick up here, wouldn't it? But that is to make the point. And as Jesus tells the story of the sower, what he is doing is he is creating a mental picture of what he is actually doing from the pulpit boat. As he sits in the boat teaching the crowd, we are to understand that he is the farmer in the story. He is scattering the seed of his teaching in order to achieve a harvest, which is the response to his teaching. But not only for that time, at that point, in that boat, by that lake. No, this is a picture that Jesus wants us to get in our mind for the whole of his ministry. It's what he's been doing for the whole of Matthew's Gospel. It is a picture of what he will continue to do through his disciples after his resurrection and ascension to heaven. It is therefore a picture of what has been happening in our world for the last 2,000 years. As the Christian gospel goes out into all the nations, it is also a picture of what is happening right now. And therefore, it is a picture of what is happening in every human heart as the word of God is taught. That's the picture that Jesus wants us to understand. It's a big picture. It's a significant picture. A picture of the whole of history. A picture of the thing that is really happening in our world that eclipses everything else. It is a picture of what is happening in every human heart as the word of God is taught. But let's push this a little bit harder. What is Jesus' aim in sowing the word? What is he actually trying to do? Can we get clear about this? If we can, I think the rest of the parable will make so much more sense. See, what do you think when you hear that Jesus is primarily a teacher? Is he, as so many people assume, a kind of a moral or religious teacher? Perhaps one of a range that you could choose from to get some kind of wisdom? Is he trying to educate us? You know, you've got Jesus, you've got Muhammad, you've got Gandhi, you've got Confucius. You can take a little bit about uh, for each one of them. So that as we listen to him, we're becoming better people. Is that what it's about? Well, let me suggest that that is not what the purpose of Jesus' teaching is at all. No, Jesus' aim, like all farmers is to produce a crop. Like all farmers, there will be challenges, as we'll see. Like all farmers, it will take time for the crop to grow, but in the end, his aim is to produce, verse 23, a spectacular crop, 160, 30 times what was sown. But let's push this a little bit harder. When do you see the crop? Well, the crop is only revealed at the harvest, and the harvest comes at the end of everything. It is at the end of the farming year. It is at the end of the farmer's work. The harvest is at the end of all things. Well, what is the harvest? Well, this is the thing, the most important thing we need to grasp this morning. This is really the key to everything else that I'm going to say. The harvest is a day of sorting, and separation. The harvest is a day when the crop is revealed. The harvest is a day of discrimination and judgment. See, I, I found this a little bit hard to work through because I've always assumed the harvest is just this wonderful, joyful moment. The harvest festival, the pumpkins come in and we're all happy. But actually, in Matthew's gospel, the harvest is the day of separation. Now, if you think about it, actually, this does make sense of any harvest. On our summer holiday this year, we stayed on a cottage in a farm 
that grows, among other things, hundreds of acres of peas. And uh, I don't know if you can imagine how, how hard it is to harvest an acres and acres of peas. They're fiddly little plants. And one warm night, it was during that sort of warm period, we were woken up at two o'clock in the morning to the rumble of machinery and the delicious smell of fresh peas. And the pea harvest was happening. And five enormous harvesters, a bit like combine harvesters, but bigger and more noisy, specialist harvesters were circling the fields with their bright floodlights. And we went out and watched and we saw what happened. And these huge and powerful and very, very specialized machines, they're, they're all about one thing. They're all about separation. They cut up and scoop up the pods and then that complicated machinery gets to work and it's all about separation gathering the millions and millions of peas and sorting them into the waiting trailers to be taken that same day to the bird's eye factory. And all the rest, all the waste is discarded out the back to be pecked over by the birds and ploughed back into the field. You see, harvest is, is about separation. And this is the harvest that Jesus is working towards, a moment of separation and discrimination and revelation where Everyone who has lived in this world will stand before God and will give an account. And what will they give an account for? Not how well they've lived, not what, what kind of moral person they have been, but what have they done with the word of Jesus Christ? So you just glance with me to next week's passage, and, and you can see this harvest theme of separation and judgment is dominating Jesus' thoughts. Just, Look down at verse 30 where he talks about a field of weeds and wheat. Let both the wheat and the weeds, verse 30, grow together until the harvest. At that time I'll tell the harvesters, first collect the weeds and tie them in bundles to be burned, then gather the wheat and bring it into my barn. It's separation, judgment, discrimination. Or look at verse 47, another kind of harvest. Once again, the kingdom of heaven is like a net that was let down into the lake and caught all kinds of fish. When it was full, the fishermen pulled it up on the shore. Then they sat down and collected the good fish in baskets and threw the bad fish away. This is a sobering image that we're going to come back to in a couple of weeks. And so, because Jesus knows the harvest is coming, the moment of sorting, separation, he wants everybody to hear the word. He wants everybody to hear so that on the last day, the harvest will be clear. This is why, for example, back in 938, Jesus, you may remember, cries out for, what does he say? More workers for the harvest field. More workers, more people to go and preach the word because the harvest is coming. And this is why at the end of the gospel, Matthew 28, his very last words are to give the disciples the commission to take the gospel to all nations before the end, before the harvest. Now, this uh, sowing of the word, this basic idea in the parable, has many implications for us this morning. Let me just mention two. First implication is that it makes clear the method and the scope of the Christian mission, doesn't it? The picture we are to have in mind of Jesus scattering the word is the picture that we are to have in mind for our own mission as a church, our Christian mission. Remember, if you were here last week, that Jesus and Jeremy Clarkson are, are, are different types of farmers for all sorts of reasons, but Jesus is not precision farming. He has not got his precision seed drill placing the seed in the best soil where it will have the best chance of germinating. No, Jesus is actually a wantonly wasteful farmer. He is scattering with gay abandon the seed all over the field. It doesn't really matter where it goes. He actually wants the seed to go everywhere. Everyone has got to hear the word because the harvest is coming. And only on the last day will you see what the good soil was. See, sometimes as Christians we fall into the Jeremy Clarkson precision drilling pattern of ministry, I will only speak the word. I will only bring the word to the people I think are going to be good soil. And sometimes we justify this by calling it strategic, but if we're honest, it's because we're afraid of failure 
and rejection. And so we hold our seed back in reserve. No precision drilling, no prejudging the soil, no self-censoring who we speak to, because the kingdom grows, the harvest comes by the widespread preaching of the gospel. Every seed is going to do its work one way or another. Every seed will reveal in time the heart of the hearer. And it's only at the end that we'll see the crop when everything gets sorted out. That's the first implication, the nature and scope of the Christian mission. The second implication, which I hope has become clear as I've been speaking, is that if you hear the words of Jesus, it really matters, doesn't it, what you do with those words. As I am speaking the words of Jesus, and as we teach the words of Jesus week by week, that work of sorting and sifting and separating is already beginning. It's a work that will continue in each human heart right up until the final whistle at the end of time and the king calls in his harvesters. And so the question that really matters for each of us this morning is are you going to be someone who listens to Jesus? Where will you be at that moment of separation? Will you be part of the crop in the kingdom of heaven? Or are you going to be separated out of the kingdom, rejected, along with those who have rejected God? It's a very serious and sobering question, isn't it? How can you tell the answer? How do you know? Well, this parable gives us a clue, doesn't it? If you're new to this, then what you've got to do is you've got to keep on listening. You've got to keep on listening until, if I can put it this way, you can see. Keep listening until you can see. Until verse 16, you have those blessed eyes and ears where where things just kind of click and you get it. You get who Jesus is. If you're new to this, we'd love to see you again. We'd love to open the Bible with you. We'd love to tell you more. You need to keep listening. But what if you're an old-timer? What if this is the 14th time you've heard the parable of the sower taught? What if you're regularly in church? Well, you may want to ask yourself a question like this. What evidence is there in your heart that the word is growing, that the word is changing you? When was the last time the word of God really made a difference in your life? When was the last time you found yourself changing your mind about something? When was the last time you made a decision that was costly to make for Jesus? And perhaps you're somewhere in between those two. Well, you particularly need to search your heart and make sure you're listening because it turns out that the farmer and his seed have enemies. It turns out that there are forces at work to stop us listening. Which brings us to our second point, the rejection of the word. Let's look now at the first three soils, or sowings in turn. Soil 1, verse 18. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. This is the seed sown along the path. Now, this first response to the word is familiar to any church that attempts to share the gospel with those around them with any seriousness. See, this morning, we are thrilled to be baptising one person. In a normal year, we baptise maybe five, ten, or a dozen people. But over the years, hundreds of people hear the message thousands of people actually from our church community through personal conversations through parents teaching their children through the children's and youth work the student work special events like the ones we're having through Christmas and Easter and Sunday by Sunday thousands of people hear the word but only a a very small fraction actually become followers of Jesus now why is this the case 
Why do so many people in our world hear the word and reject it? See, it could be that we are doing something wrong, couldn't it? It could be that we're missing a trick. It could be that we're not very good at the mission. It could be, and this is the fear that every church leader has, that actually when we meet Jesus, it's going to be like the young people on The Apprentice meeting Alan Sugar in the boardroom, where he kind of rolls his eyes and tells them they're a load of Muppets because they just, they just missed a trick. But it's not the case. No, verse 19 tells us, gives us two very important clues. Look at verse 19, two clues to explain exactly what is happening. First, notice Jesus tells us there that the word he is sowing is, look at it, verse 19, the message of the kingdom. The message of the kingdom. Now that clearly is a summary for what Jesus has been teaching up to this point and will go on to explain in the rest of the gospel. This is the halfway point of uh, the gospel of Matthew. And the message of the kingdom is what Jesus has been teaching and will go on to teach till the end. Therefore, the message of the kingdom is this. It is the proclamation of the kingship of Jesus. So yesterday, very happily for preachers of Matthew's gospel, a historic event was televised for the first time. The proclamation of the kingship of Charles. He was declared king in the Privy Council, and then messengers went out to all the nations to declare his kingship, the gospel of Charles III. And one of the commentators in a sort of interview panel afterwards summed it up like this. He said, this is very simple. There is a new king, and the word must be spread. The gospel of King Charles. The gospel of Jesus is exactly the same. The message of the kingdom is a declaration that the world has a new king, King Jesus. There is a new king and the message must be spread. And this is what Jesus has been talking about since 4.17 when he said, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. The message of the kingdom then, in the second half of the gospel, gets expanded so that we will understand that the kingship of Jesus will not come when he enters a throne room with all sorts of ceremony and splendor. But the kingship will come when he actually is lifted on a cross to die. To die for the forgiveness of our sins. And the kingship of Jesus will be declared when he rises from the dead and sends out his disciples into all the world to preach the gospel. In other words, the message of the kingdom is big. It's enormous. It's bigger than anything that has happened this week. And that is saying something. I turned 50. No, that's only a joke. (laughs) A lot has happened this week. But it's eclipsed. It's minuscule compared to this, the message of the kingdom. The announcement of God's king over all creation. God is bringing the creation under the rule of Jesus. It's big. If you haven't taken any notes this morning, don't worry, you don't have to take notes, but you might want to write that down. It's big. Two words to take home. And because it's big, it has implications for every sphere of life. As Daniel explained so clearly, nothing now can be the same for him because he is now somebody who submits to Jesus. It's not just one bit of his life. It is going to affect all of his life. That's the first clue in verse 19. The second clue in verse 19 is that word understand. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in his heart. Now, this understanding is not an intellectual assent to the truths of the gospel or a mental ability to grasp the message. No, 
verse 19 hints at something much more fundamental going on. Notice in verse 19, there is a spiritual battle for understanding going on in the heart of everybody who hears the word. A spiritual battle involving God's personal enemy, the devil. In other words, this understanding is a moral or even better, a relational understanding, a willingness to humbly accept the lordship of Jesus Christ and its implications for the whole of life. Now, it just happens that there is nothing better than baptism to demonstrate the nature of that commitment. Later, I'm going to ask Daniel three questions. One, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your own saviour? Two, do you commit yourself to follow him for the rest of your life? Three, do you renounce the devil and all his works? Can you see how wholehearted you have to be to answer those questions in the affirmative? And those questions express the understanding that every believer has come to that they're going to submit to King Jesus. And if you can answer those three questions, then two things follow. One, you cannot carry on living as you did before. You've given your whole life to Jesus. Two, you've made an enemy of the devil. And the rest of your life now, the rest of your life is going to be a battle to hold on to the word, to hold on to that understanding which is a commitment to live for Jesus or to give it up you've made an enemy and so if you don't feel that battle going on in your heart you need to be very very careful if you don't feel that your enemy is the devil it's a warning sign that the word has not taken root and Satan has snatched away the word already. Well, this helps us to understand soil too. The one who received the seed that fell on rocky places is the man who hears the word and at once receives it with joy. But since he has no root, he lasts only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, he quickly falls away. Now here is someone who on the face of it looks quite different to the first soil. They are happy and excited to hear the word. These are great people to have in church. These are great people to have in your Bible study, in your youth group, in your camp, because they seem so hungry. They come back for more. They seem to have got it. They've grown fast. But notice the thing that characterizes this person's spiritual journey is speed. They are quick to begin the Christian life, and they are quick to end it. Why? Look at verse 21. When trouble or persecution comes, he quickly falls away. But notice, in the middle of that sentence, what kind of trouble, what kind of persecution? There's all sorts of troubles in this world. There are high energy bills, there is sudden sickness, there are all sorts of misfortunes. Look at verse 21. When trouble or persecution comes, because of the word, that is the hardship, the disadvantage, the hassle, the loss, the inconvenience of giving your life to Jesus now starts to set in and make itself clear. And if we'd understood, we would have been prepared for this, you see. Back in 5 verse 10 in the famous Sermon on the Mount, Jesus said that those who are in the kingdom will be persecuted. He'd already said that. In 10.22, he warned his followers, his potential followers. He said, all men will hate you because of me. So if we'd understood the gospel in the first place, we would have been resilient to this particular attack. And so why are these people taken by surprise when trouble or persecution comes? Because they had not understood the message of the kingdom. If they'd understood the message of the kingdom and its consequences for life, they would be safe. But because they have not understood, because they've just seen one part of the gospel, not the whole, 
As soon as they have to make a decision for Christ that hurts, the gospel they thought they understood no longer makes sense, and they give up. Well, what about soil three? The one who received the seed, verse 22, that fell among the thorns, is the man who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke it, making it unfruitful. Now, this is the seed that lasts longer than the others, sometimes much, much longer. And the problem here is not that the heart is hard, like the path, or shallow, like the rocky soil. The problem is competition. This is an overcrowded heart. There is simply no room for the message of the kingdom to grow and take charge of the heart as it should. Now notice carefully that the competition comes from two directions but amounts to the same thing. On the one hand, there is what Jesus calls the worries of this life. Now, the word Jesus uses here is the New Testament word for anxiety, which literally refers to someone being pulled in two different directions. To be anxious, in New Testament terms, is to have your heart and mind torn in two different directions. The person who is anxious is anxious about their earthly life, their here and now life. Their energies and their emotions and their mental horizons are split between Jesus' kingdom and this kingdom. And so work and family and marriage and health and children and education and career and what the world thinks of me and so on and so forth, these are the things that are taking their mind and tearing them away from the kingdom. So they're a little bit like that. I think there's a fish that can see in two directions. It can see below the water and it can see above the water. Imagine that kind of swivel, swivel thing that it does. That is anxiety in the New Testament, looking in two directions at the same time, split between living for Jesus and living for this world. On the other hand, there is the deceitfulness of riches, which I think is the alluring dream that if you could just get everything sorted, you wouldn't need to be anxious. And then you could focus on the kingdom. But these people never seem to get to that point, and so they're always chasing that dream, always split, never fully sold out for Jesus. Now again, if they'd understood, they would be prepared for this. Just flip back with me, if you would, to chapter 6, and you'll see it there. Chapter 6, leave a finger or something in chapter 13. Chapter 6, 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasure on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasure in heaven, where wrath and must, uh, rust do not destroy. Or verse 24, you cannot serve both God and money. Therefore I tell you, verse 25, do not worry about your life. Do not be anxious about what you'll eat or drink or about your body, what you'll wear. Just look down at verse 33, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Flip back to chapter 13. So the seed that falls in the first three soils, produces three responses. It's the same seed, but it's produced three different ways. But of course, in the end, it produces only one crop. Now, before we come to the fourth soil, let me mention a couple of implications, particularly for those involved in sowing. It is often pointed out that although there are four soils, there are, in the end, only two results, crop or no crop. Now this, of course, is true in the final analysis, but at the same time, the parable of the sower does perfectly describe the day-to-day -day experience of Christian ministry. It tells us, for example, to expect mixed results, that there will be people who fall away over time. There will be those people who appear very enthusiastic, and seem to grow very quickly, full of encouragement, hungry for the word. But then it warns us that that moment will come when there's something in the Bible that they read or hear that is going to be too costly for them. And you know there's going to be a moment of decision. 
And you'll know that for some people, they can hang on for ages, for years. But you watch their life and you're, you're never quite sure whether they are making Jesus number one. You know that people are always juggling? It's a great word we use, isn't it? They say, I'm juggling. I've got so many things to juggle. And you see them juggling and you think, which is the ball they are going to drop? Is it going to be the Jesus ball that gets dropped? And if you've been around churches for any length of time, you know what the journey looks like. A few more missed meetings. A few less times at the growth group or the church meeting. A little bit less contact. And then the unreturned texts. And then the holding Christians at arm's length. And then one day you bump into them in the street and you realise they've completely fallen away. And actually... The tragic thing about this person is that they were worse than they were at the beginning because they are hardened to the message of the gospel and they will never listen to it again. Mixed results because others. Sometimes the people you least expect let the words sink deep and already you can see their lives bearing fruit. And this also explains, doesn't it, the agony and the joy of Christian ministry. If you have any responsibility for teaching the Bible, perhaps you're a small group leader, you know what it's like to worry about the members of your group that don't show up regularly. And if you are one of those members of the group who don't show up regularly, you now understand what your leader is worrying about and why they want you to show up regularly. Not because they need you there, because they've made a piece of cake that divides into eight, and if there's only seven of them, it's going to be a problem. That they want you there because they are worried about your heart. And while you may see the skipping of the group as part of the solution to the problem of all the things you've got to juggle, because this is one less thing to juggle, your leader can tell you and see that actually coming to the group is part of the solution. Because there is nothing you need more, no matter what is going on in your life. There is nothing you need more than to hear the word. It also tells us to expect delayed results, doesn't it? It tells us to be patient, to persevere, to pray. And I think this is a particular encouragement to parents. Don't give up. Be patient. Let the word do its work in its time. And it also reminds us And perhaps most importantly of all, to make sure that the word we are sowing is the gospel. That the cost of following Jesus is part of the message. That we don't pretend that being a Christian is going to be easy. That we don't avoid the hard parts of the Bible in order to gain more disciples because we won't gain more disciples in the long run. And that we don't confuse real repentance with the buzz of community, the fellowship of the church, or the emotion that can come when you begin to understand the gospel. Mixed results. Delayed results. But there will be a harvest at the end. And it will be better than anything we can imagine, which brings us very briefly to the final soil. Look with me then at verse 23. The one who received the word that fell on good soul is the man who hears the word and understands it. He produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. So I think the new learning for me this week as I've studied this is that I've always kind of thought there's something mysteriously special about this fourth soil. It's a bit like the, the, the pot noodles. It's a long time since I've had a pot noodle, but you know, they're just instant, aren't they? You just kind of bung in the hot water and boosh, there's your lunch. Instant. I think there's a sense in which we think this fourth soil is, has that kind of magic quality about it. The word hits it and whoosh up it goes. Instantly and effortlessly. But what we need to do is to think this soil in the light of the other three. 
See, what has this person done that the others have failed to do? What makes this person's heart good soil? Well, look at verse 23, where Jesus repeats that word, understanding. They have not only heard the word, they have understood the word. Unlike the first soil, they have humbly received the gospel of Jesus' kingship. They've realized this is big. They've realized that if Jesus is king, I cannot live for this world any longer. If he has died for my sins, I must turn away from those sins. Unlike the second soil, they've been prepared when trouble and persecution comes. They understand that Jesus died on the cross for them, and so it stands to reason that the king who suffered calls us to suffer for him too. And unlike the third soil, they've not lived their life with a divided focus like those fish with eyes that point in two directions, but they've been focused on the kingdom of God and have cultivated an undivided heart, sold out to live for Jesus, no matter what. And so the fourth soil is the heart of someone who understands the message of the kingdom and its consequences for life and keeps on listening and understanding and persevering right to the end. Well, next week, we're going to look more closely at that great harvest of separation, the awesome and terrible day when Jesus will sort everything out. And each of us will give an account for how we have listened to his teaching. The question that remains for us this morning is, where do you want to be on the great day of the harvest of Jesus? Outside the kingdom or inside the kingdom? Fruitful or fruitless? Part of the wastage or part of the crop? Do you want to be part of the kingdom of Jesus? Then all you have to do is keep listening all the way to the end. Well, I put a prayer on the sheet that I'm going to lead us in, in a moment. You might just want to skim over it and understand it. And this will be a great prayer for anybody to pray this morning, whether this is your first time with us, or whether you've been a Christian a long time, to commit ourselves to the lifelong work the saving work of listening to Jesus and speaking it to others. Let's pray as I lead us. Heavenly Father, I know I do not deserve to enter your kingdom, but need your forgiveness for the times I've hardened my heart to your word. Thank you that Jesus died in my place so my sins can be forgiven. Please help me to make it my life's work to listen to your word and speak it to others and to be part of your joyful, fruitful harvest in the end. Amen.